delighted to welcome onto the show uh, the University of Oxford Professor of Astrophysics and Citizen Science Lead, Chris Lintart. Uh, how's lockdown treating you, Chris? Well, I, I'm pretty lucky. Um, so I, I, don't, I am. Yeah, this is the <laughs> flag in Oxford. I've resorted to virtual visits to the pub, which is the main problem for me. But no, things are fine. Um, we've got um, our students and our team working from home. So um, I just have a shorter commute, really. It's not the same for everyone. But uh, I was just listening to you talking about the skies. Isn't it, isn't it a blessing uh, that it's being clear? It's like been the, last few, the, sa the saving grace has been seeing the ISS and watching Venus and watching people discover our mm -hmm. great subject as yeah. well. We're used to going outside and looking up when you leave a pub, but yeah. um, watching other people discover that that's Venus and that you can see it the next night and that it changes and and, and so on has, has been, I think, the thing that's that's kept me going. It's like things have flipped around rather than us trying to encourage people to look out into the sky. Almost on a daily basis, people have been getting in touch with us via Twitter and saying, what's this that I'm seeing in the sky? And, yeah, uh, that, that, you know, people are right. out I, Although I did enjoy an email I got from somebody who said that they'd seen the bright thing in the sky. They'd asked somebody what it was. They were told it was Venus, but they weren't satisfied with that answer <laughs> uh, and, and would like a different explanation. But, but sorry, it, it was still <laughs> Venus. So... Uh, but, but also things like people have been noticing people were out. We had that wonderful run of space station passes here in the UK, uh, mm. which lasted the first couple of weeks mm. that people were at home and people were out seeing the station, which is so it's good. But then noticing other satellites. And I think a lot of people who don't know the sky well were surprised as to how easy it is to see satellites. You go outside within a few hours after dusk, you wait. Uh, <laughs> you know, you're much more likely to see a satellite than a meteor these days. Oh, yeah. um, and I, I and think if anyone's that got anything, sort of... I was going to say, if anyone's got anything at the minute, it's time, right? <laughs> to just sit there yes. and look. Yeah, I'd say just, I think, well, I think there's, there's also the people who are uh, rushed off their feet. Um, so I, I'm getting two kinds of, I'm getting people with the time to enjoy and learn and, and think, and we, we see those people in our citizen science budget. There are also people, I think, stopping halfway up the stairs to look out the window and just have a moment to themselves. So, yeah. so people who don't have time could, could you know, I'm a great fan of lazy astronomy. I think we, <laughs> I'm used to uh, long nights with a telescope and, and trying to see detail on Jupiter or Orion Nebula with the naked eye or with the eye or whatever else. But, but there's something wonderful about, oh yeah, there's the moon, I'll see that again tomorrow. I think that that, that sort, of, sort of straightforward everyday astronomy is, is getting a lot of people through uh these very strange weeks that we're living through yeah well being the uh, the zookeeper of citizen science chris i wanted to ask you a question uh from one of our listeners that came in that was perfect for you really um um your latest books um actually states with more data you need more scientists so that leads us nicely into a question from david schlout via twitter who asks, are there ways for an amateur astrophotographer to get involved in contributing to actual science? And I think it'd be really interesting to hear both from the viewpoint of what an ast amateur astrophotographer can do to get involved in contributing to, to proper science, but also what anybody else can do from their armchair. Yeah, of course. Well, it's an interesting thing. I think as long as I've been interested in astronomy, people have been forecasting the death of, of the amateur scientists. So people have always said that the the next generation of skies, professional sky surveys will knock out any space that the amateurs can, can contribute. And it hasn't happened and it's not going to happen because the sky is big and there are things that you could only do with a distributed network of, of small telescopes. So, um, you know, I, th I think the things that, that are really alive right now are the planetary photographers. So we rely on amateur astronomers to tell us about Jupiter and Saturn and what's happening to the extent that um, NASA's Juno mission, which is in orbit around Jupiter, does these swoops very close to, to the poles of Jupiter, um, relies on amateurs for the images that give the probe data its context. Oh, right. And there's been close collaboration. So if, if, you're, if you're getting into astrophotography and your aim is to um, take um, part in science, I think planetary photography is your thing. Um, there are also deep sky photographers that contrib contribute, particularly looking at very faint structures, the kind of thing where these dedicated people go out and build up two or three or 400 hours worth of data on a single field so that you can get a very deep image. That's hugely helpful and, and professionals need that information and haven't 
uh, really got got the hang of doing it ourselves. The amateur images are, tend to be better. So there are ways for, for astrophotographers to contribute. If you don't have a camera, you're not that technical. Meteor counting is still useful. Um, mm, yeah. So I, I still go and count meteor showers because that's how I can contribute as a back garden astronomer with um, a drink and a deck chair. You know, it's the easiest form uh, uh, of observing. Uh, and then my, my own work during the day is to run the Zooniverse platform, which has uh, 98 live projects online today. Not all astronomical, but where 98. people can look. 98. That's so people can look insane. for planets. People can help explore um, the Martian poles. Uh, you can classify galaxies, and there's loads of astronomy there. So, so that's your cloudy night alter. If it's clear, put the computer down and go outside, yeah. or look out the window. If it's um, if it's possible, if it's cloudy, then then you can go to the computer and, and still do something in five minutes that's useful to um, to, to to help us understand the universe. Yeah, where, where I hope you didn't want short answers. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 we've got yes, plenty of time to fill. Contribute. Yeah, so this is what happens when I'm in a pub. You get the long, loquacious answers. It's when there's no cues at the bar, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it gets you, yeah though, to you, can't, you can't quite see. I was on a telecon with this background, a wider version of it earlier, and one of my students messaged me and, and was worried that the two people in the back corner haven't moved in an hour. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the prod, see if they're okay. <laughs> Uh, where, where, where does um, people like Terry Lovejoy sit who are kind of on that boundary of amateur and professional and, and you know, they're, they're out finding comets and things like that? Yeah, yeah. And of course, Comet Borisov, um, yeah. which was the, the first big interstellar comet that came mm. through the solar system. That was an amateur discovery. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I think we in, in, in the professional world, we've started to call these people citizen scientists. Yeah. Um, I know I'm not hugely in love with the term. It's sort of weirdly loaded. Like, what does it mean to be a citizen? What does it mean to be a scientist? But to get away from this sense that there's professional and then there's amateur. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. we're all, even the professional, I'm lucky enough to be paid for it, but I'm exploring the universe because it's what I've always wanted to do. So I, I think we just get rid of those boundaries. And there, there are certainly people with the kit to rival the professionals. I've been thinking about this a lot recently because... Um, a lot of the big telescopes are shut down. Um, and while we've still got things like the automatic scopes that scan for near-Earth asteroids, if we, um, you know, if, if something dramatic happened, if a big supernova went off tomorrow, we're going to be reliant on amateur images to give us the context, at least in the build-up. So, so this, this, this may be the worst time for a supernova to go off, but it would be fun to try to coordinate uh, everyone's <laughs> observations. Yeah. So did, did Paul spot one first the other night, or no. did that not come to pass? No, we, we but but we but it's a good example. Paul yeah. uh, on Twitter. Uh, we, we, will you tell the story, Paul? Oh, it was. I was looking. Um, what was it? Uh, two nights ago. Um, I was looking looking at various galaxies in uh, Canon's Vinatechi, and it was M sixty three, and it was just a, what looked like a very very curious one of those tiny tiny sort of spots of light. Um, I've seen supernovas in a couple of galaxies in the past where people have found them and you go and you get that very very tiny dot in a, in a visual telescope um, and yeah M, it was M63 and I, I kept going back to it I kept checking it wasn't just it was there it was something there but I mean probably just my aging eyes and, and weird seeing and things like that but um, it, I, I, I thought I'd sort of mention it on Twitter and see if anyone had noticed and, and Chris picked it up yeah, um, and the, I know I know the people we work with. One of the things we do in this university is, is help to hunt for supernovae. So I talked to my friends at Queen's University Belfast and in Minnesota, and they found out the, the Atlas telescope, which discovered mm. Comet Atlas, had looked at M63 just a few hours uh, before we asked. So we got the, the data and, mm. and, and no supernova. But it turned out that group are haunted by, I think in 2014, somewhere around then, there was a supernova at the center of um, M103, I think. Um, and uh, it was missed by all the professionals and found by amateurs. Yeah. So, and it turned out that some of the amateurs had told the professionals it was there, but it wasn't in their survey. And the algorithms didn't find it. And there's a similar case, the M82 supernova, supernova which was, mm. uh, what, 2014 as well, I think, which was found by Steve Fossey at University College London and a bunch of undergrads who were having yeah. pizza while imaging it. And they found it because Steve, who knows the like the back of his hand, looked at the image on the screen and went, that shouldn't be there. And it was missed <laughs> by all the algorithms because mm -hmm. um, they'd learned that anything that bright couldn't be real. 
Um, and so this is something I talk about in, the, in my book, actually, and, and, and something that powers us at the Zooniverse, is that by having eyes on the problem, people who, who know what they're doing, and, and, and either by the web or reality, you can be surprised by the really unexpected stuff. And, and so we need the automated professional searches, but I, I'm convinced in 10 years' time we'll still be talking about discoveries of, of interesting things by amateur astronomers. Yeah, why would you not take advantage of those hundreds of thousands of eyes that are always on the sky? Yeah, I think that's a good point. And, and, and people who, human beings are very good at being distracted and we're very good at being distracted by the unexpected. And, and, and that's rather hard to program. So I could build, you know, even I can write an algorithm that would tell me when something bright is in the sky, but only me standing in the garden will distinguish the, Saturn, the ISS that goes over every so often from the alien spacecraft that's arrived. There isn't really an alien spacecraft. I'm, just, that's, that's <laughs> I'm sorry, I was just distracted by a message that we've got popping up saying that um, you mentioned mm. your book, um, saying it's a great book, reviewed it for Astronomy Now, everyone should buy it. So there you go. Yes, I agree. You don't even have to read it. <laughs> just buy it, that's the important <laughs> thing. Just buy it. That, 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 that's fine. Yeah. We say exactly the same about podcast downloads. You don't need to listen to it, just download <laughs> it. Yeah. Just download it. Yeah, so the, the, next question musician, the, ask, music, the musicians have it terribly because you have to listen to at least 30 seconds of a song on a streaming service to get them paid. So they've actually point? got to be good. Yeah. Oh, bad, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As if streaming music wasn't bad enough for the musicians. Right, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the next question we want to ask you is from our good friend Mark DeVries, listener, uh, Mark DeVray, um, who asks about the, the Square Kilometre Array and the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, which do you think is going to generate the most exciting science? And if each one could answer just one question about the universe, what would you like it to be? There's a lot in that one. Well, what, one of them should find aliens. That would be great. If I have to pick anything, that, that would be fab. And You're going aliens rather chance. than just biosignatures. Uh, no, actual aliens. If I've got, if I'm going to call the shot, that, yeah. that would be fantastic. Yeah. Alien, oh, yeah. Aliens, high, aliens yeah. we can ask. Aliens, which we can ask questions of on Zoom, would be brilliant. Um, so that's that. Which of them's going to be better? I don't know. They're both. They're both great. They're both hugely expensive, uh, and they they're designed to do sort of different things actually. So James Webb is an infrared telescope. The way to think about it is it's a first light machine. So it's looking for the first stars of the first galaxies. And we've got this slight mystery in that I think. Um, one way of putting it is that the universe grew up faster than we expected. So we see in the deep Hubble images some quite well-developed galaxies already, uh, even though we're going back to maybe a billion years after the Big Bang. And that's a bit of a mystery. So, so understanding the period from maybe half a, a billion years to a billion years after the Big Bang is, is crucial to, to make sure our theories are right. So I'm really looking forward to James Webb giving us those images. They will look like blobs but they will mean a lot. Yeah. So the blobology of James Webb Space Telescope <laughs> is, is, is the thing. SK is going to take a while to ramp up. Um, the nice thing about it, it's, it's a radio telescope. It's an array. Um, so it's going to cover a large land area, but you can build it in bits. So what they call 1% SK, like a 1% of the dishes is already up and running. So the thing I'm most excited about, the, uh, um, the, the full SK, when we get there in probably 20, maybe even more years time, that will fill in the gap. So that's every galaxy in the universe. But in the short term, what we're excited about, is, or I'm excited about, are, are transients, things that go bang in the radio sky. We know there are these fast radio bursts, uh, which have been detected. We don't know what they are. We don't know how common they are. We don't know whether they're different types. Knowing astronomers, there will soon be a type two and a type one fast radio burst. Mm -hmm. We know they sometimes, but don't always repeat. They're not regular. And these things are, are really mysterious. And, and, and with the bits of SK, SK that we're building now, and some clever computer processing, and maybe a Zooniverse project, but mostly the computer processing. Um, I think getting a real handle on what FRBs are, and every time we've expanded into new sensitivity ranges in the radio sky, we found new things from pulsars all the way through to, to FRBs. So I, I think new types of radio transient will be the big story from, from SKA in the next 10 years or so. What, what's your best guess for FRBs? Um, well, they've got to be something compact, so because they're so brief, so they've got to come from something small. So um, at least some of them are probably neutron stars colliding, things like that. But um, I'm not utterly convinced. So we see these; some of them repeat, mm. um, and I'm not yet convinced that the ones that don't repeat, they may not be the same thing as the repeating ones. 
right. and there may be more exotic phenomena, but it's going to be in the sort of black hole neutron star uh, interaction kind kind of thing, I think. And maybe some exotic matter on the neutron star. I, 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 we just don't, we, we, we don't, we just don't know. Um, we don't know um, enough about them yet. I can't even mm. tell you uh, how, what frequency they're most common at. And I can't tell you the ones that repeat seem to jump about in frequency a bit, which that confused me. Something that does the repeats, but does the thing differently every time. Mm -hmm. That does that. That's a bit strange. Um, maybe aliens, of course. Um, <laughs> but, but, but probably how you've said it. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for uh, agreeing to join us at such uh, late notice, Chris. And it's good to know that there's so much that anyone can be doing to help advance science at any time of the day or night. And this is a, a really good time for people to, to get involved in that when uh, for a lot of people who are furloughed and in unfortunate circumstances at the moment can uh, occupy their minds in different ways and also uh, um, advance professional science. Um, Chris's latest book, which we reviewed a few episodes ago, along with Matthew, um, The Crowd and the Cosmos, um, is a, a great read. You should go out and buy that. Thanks very much, Chris, and we'll see you soon. My pleasure. Stay safe. You too. Bye-bye.